Thanks for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Charlene Aaron. The second American infected with Ebola arrives home today. Both Nancy Wrightbull and Dr. Kent Brantley, the other American infected with the virus, are said to be improving. This after receiving an experimental drug. Caitlin Burke reports. It's a drug never tested on humans, used out of desperation. It's known as ZMAP, and it seems to be working. Nancy Ritball and Dr. Kent Brantley each received a dose of the drug before leaving Liberia. The effects are noticeable. She was eating a little bit, um, able to take in fluid. Um, so, you know, we're cautious, cautiously optimistic. Brantley is also getting stronger. He was given both a dose of ZMAP and a unit of blood from an Ebola survivor, giving him antibodies the patient's body may have made to fight the virus. ZMAP is part of an ongoing research program backed by the U.S. government and military. It works by boosting the immune system and is made from antibodies produced by lab animals who were exposed to parts of Ebola. Still, there's no known cure for the virus, and doctors remain hesitant to call the drug or any other treatment a success so early on. Meanwhile, an Ebola outbreak continues to ravage three African countries. Today, the death toll hovering close to 900. Despite the risk, missionary doctors like Dr. Brantley continue to be on the front lines. If you look back in history, clear back in 260 AD, when there was an epidemic in Italy, five million people died of smallpox. And Christian leaders at that time wrote about Christians out in the street taking care of these people, actually sacrificing their lives to take care of others. Health officials here in the U.S. remain on alert with CDC staff at 20 U.S. airports and border crossings evaluating passengers with possible symptoms. No cases here have been reported. One patient was treated in a New York hospital with Ebola-like symptoms, but initial tests show it's unlikely he has the virus. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Dr. David Stevens had much more to say about the work and faith of his colleague, Dr. Brantley. To see the full interview, you can go to our webpage, cbnnews.com. As the deadly Ebola virus gains more attention around the globe, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is warning Americans to avoid travel to some West African nations. The CDC has sent more than 20 staffers to West Africa to help control the outbreak and plans to send 50 more to help screen passengers. Ebola is not airborne and is only transmitted through direct contact. There is no vaccine for it. A ceasefire is in effect in the Gaza Strip today. Hamas and Israel agreed to a three-day truce to set the stage for peace talks. During the month-long conflict, the world has seen scores of media images of Israeli attacks on Hamas targets in Gaza. But as Chris Mitchell reports, the media hasn't been showing the other side of the story. Hamas militants invading Israel and launching rockets at the Jewish state. Here's that story. For more than a month, Israel's efforts to stop Gaza rocket fire and destroy Hamas tunnels has made headlines and led newscasts around the world. Two images dominate the war between Israel and Hamas. On one side is Israel's military actions, like airstrikes, artillery and ground troops. On the other side, video of Palestinians suffering, wounded or killed in those military actions. But what's missing? In Gaza, we have not seen Hamas fighters. They are not roaming the streets of Gaza City. They're not carrying weapons. Where are they? We've never seen those pictures in four weeks of reporting from this region. The Western press has not had access to the, uh, to the, to the fighting arm of Hamas. So the, the impression creating is you have an Israeli army fighting and you have Palestinians on, on the other side. And that's already uh, playing into Hamas's uh, media strategy. Hamas media watchdogs also crush what they consider negative reports. Hamas expelled this reporter from the Gaza Strip for his reports on Twitter. CBN News' George Thomas spoke with him inside Gaza. He came to us, in essence, telling us that uh, he was hauled in by Hamas militants and uh, interrogated and uh, threatened uh, and said that uh, he, they didn't like the tweets he was uh, tweeting, in essence, uh, telling the world that Hamas was using civilian areas, in this particular case, using this journalist hotel right next to his hotel to fire off rockets from the Gaza Strip into Israel. And they gave him uh, 24 hours to get out of the Strip. Italian journalist Gabriel Barbati posted this on Twitter only after leaving Hamas-controlled Gaza. Out of Gaza, far from Hamas retaliation, 
misfired rocket killed children yesterday in Chati. Witness, militants rushed and cleared debris. His tweet corroborated the IDF account that Hamas rockets, not the IDF, hit the Al Shifa hospital on July 28th. Filmmaker Michael Grinspan posted this exchange with a Spanish journalist on Facebook. I asked him, how come we never see on television channels reporting from Gaza any Hamas people? No gunmen, no rocket launcher, no policemen. We only see civilians on these reports, mostly women and children. He answered me, frankly, it's very simple. We did see Hamas people there launching rockets. They were close to our hotel. But if ever we dare pointing our camera on them, they would simply shoot at us and kill us. There was evidence that Hamas was using hospitals, schools, uh, civilian neighborhoods, mosques to launch their rockets. There was evidence of that, but they did not want the Western world to know that. Oren says keeping the Western world in the dark works with predictable and devastating consequences. And they're using the civilian population as human shields, and so Israel no matter how cautious it is, it invariably ends up causing civilian casualties. That creates very painful pictures on television screens that immediately incites the streets, particularly in Europe and South America, that immediately translates into diplomatic pressure in the Security Council and human rights groups. They realize that they have a captive audience among Western journalists to report one side, to show these horrific pictures of men, women, and children injured, killed. Look, I, I, you, we don't excuse this. It's horrible, this is war. These are the realities of war. But you have to be able to question Hamas straightforward. You have to ask them, are you using uh, United Nations uh, uh, facilities? Are you using schools? Are you using mosques and places of worship? Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. The Church of England is calling on Britain's government to open its doors to Christians fleeing persecution in Iraq. The Guardian reports a growing number of bishops are speaking out. They say the UK has a moral obligation to help the Christian community because of its role in the 2003 invasion. An estimated one million Christians lived in Iraq before the invasion, but most have fled due to attacks by jihadists and sectarian violence. In June, militants took over the ancient Christian city of Mosul, forcing tens of thousands to flee. France has already announced it will give asylum to Iraqi Christians. Kentucky's tourism department has awarded $18 million in tax breaks for a biblical theme park. The Ark Encounter is set to be built in Williamstown and will feature a 510-foot-long replica of Noah's Ark. The group Answers in Genesis is leading the effort. It's the same group that operates the Creation Museum. The price tag to build the Christian park is estimated around $172 million. Construction is scheduled to begin this year with an opening date set for the summer of 2016. The state legislature still has to approve the funding for the park. Coming up, a lesson from the war in Gaza. Is the U.S. vulnerable to terrorists using tunnels along the U.S.-Mexico border? A new poll shows the majority of Americans agree building better infrastructure for transportation is worthwhile, but they are divided over how to pay for it. An AP GFK poll found six in 10 of those surveyed say the economic benefits of good highways, railroads and airports outweigh the cost. But 58 percent oppose raising federal gasoline taxes to fund transportation projects. Only 14 percent support any increase. The majority of those surveyed oppose paying private companies in exchange for the right to charge tolls. The Border Patrol has discovered several large areas of damaged border fence between the United States and Mexico. Agents discovered a garage-sized hole cut in the steel fence just east of Nogales, Arizona, and heavy rainstorms knocked down 60 feet of the rebar reinforced fence west of the Nogales Mariposa entry point. That fence stood 18 to 26 feet high and extended at least seven feet underground. The fence is constantly monitored by agents because smugglers and others routinely try to breach or knock down parts of the fence. The Gaza war has highlighted the sophisticated network of tunnels Hamas terrorists use to infiltrate Israel. But could terrorists use similar tunnels to get into the U.S.? Well, it turns out the U.S. Border Patrol has a special unit for finding and destroying smuggling tunnels. Chief International Reporter Gary Lane asked political host and analyst Michael Dozer what the government should do to block this terror possible terrorist threat. 
What's the security risk that you're seeing? Well, it's a, it's a homeland security nightmare that's going on right now. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people coming across our borders, and we really don't know who they are. But a lot of the remnants that they're leaving gives us the clue of where they're coming from. There are a lot of prayer rugs that we're finding, um, a lot of uh, even some um, documents left by uh, Pakistanis, Iranians, uh, people from Iraq. So uh, these are some of the concerns that we, we have that are coming right now into our border. So, so these aren't just Central Americans, poor kids seeking better opportunities. Are you saying there's a possibility we have some terrorists coming in? I'm saying that there are some terrorists coming in. If you listen to the testimony by Robert Mueller, Mueller uh, then FBI director, he testified in front of Congress that there are several um, al-Qaeda type operatives coming into our border. And he said that they were learning Spanish they were changing their surname into Hispanic names. They were dressing as Hispanics, and they were coming into our border speaking Spanish. And now, we've seen some drug tunnels that have been discovered. What about the potential of Hamas-like tunnels that Israel discovered in Gaza on our southern border? Is that a possibility as well, Michael? We've had many reports of tunnels. In fact, I, I want to read you something that a uh, Muslim cleric wrote recently. His name is Abdullah al-Nafsi. He wrote that they do not, the terrorists no longer need planning or airplanes. They, all they need is uh, to come through our border, through the tunnels, into the United States with a, with a briefcase full of um, anthrax that will kill millions of Americans. And I'm, I'm sure some people will say, well, you've got the Rio Grande River there. You won't have tunnels. You won't see tunnels like Israel saw in Gaza. Uh, but you're saying it's a strong possibility. Yes. In fact, Patrick Toole, uh, uh, who was uh, part of the uh, Border Patrol, he testified also in Congress that Hamas was coming into the borders. And they found propaganda from Hamas, who was coming, uh, who were coming into the border. There are several uh, on the border states. There are several farms that have reported uh, people coming through tunnels near their property. And there are some specifics. Tell us about the six uh, so-called special interest aliens that were captured by Border Patrol. They were speaking uh, Spanish, but uh, they found they found information on them from Iran, Pakistan and a couple of other um, Middle Eastern uh, countries. They had uh, Iraq, Iraqi dinars on them, and uh, they also had prayer rugs with them. Thank you, Michael Dozier, TeaParty.org, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, the presidential hopeful who got his nickname from watching The Brady Bunch. Here at Bobby Jindal's American Dream, next. The Standard & Poor's rating agency says the rising wealth gap in the U.S. is slowing economic growth, but that changing the tax code to narrow the gap isn't the answer. S&P says that higher taxes on the wealthy removes incentives for people to work and causes businesses to hire fewer employees. The group estimates the economy would grow by half a percent per year if the average American worker had completed one more year of school. The S&P says the economy will likely see more, quote, boom bust cycles and will grow about 2.5 percent a year for the next decade. Turning now to the political scene, Louisiana's Bobby Jindal shot into the national spotlight as the first Indian American governor. Now he's considering a run for the White House. Jennifer Wishon brings us this fascinating look at the life, the faith and the future of the governor of Louisiana. You can spend hours looking at these pictures. Bobby Jindal grew up not far from the governor's mansion here in Baton Rouge. His dad wanted him to be a doctor. But despite getting into medical and law schools at both Harvard and Yale, Jindal chose a life of public service. Technically, your name is not Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, the story my mom uh, loves to tell everybody. When I was four years old, I used to come home from school, and at the time, 
I was allowed to watch a little bit of TV. And one of the shows that was on in syndication was The Brady Bunch. It was one of my favorite shows. I'd watch it every afternoon. And if you remember, Bobby Brady was the youngest boy on that show. And I guess I just identified with him because we were the same age. We probably had the same interest. You know, we didn't like girls or whatever. We liked to play football. So one day my mom was picking me up from school and the teacher said, well, your son's got a new name. And she said, what are you talking about? Apparently I just showed up one day without telling her, without asking her for permission, showed up and told all my friends to call me Bobby from that day on. And they did. His parents immigrated here to Louisiana from India looking for a better life. Jendel says he ran for public office to ensure their grandchildren don't have to leave the state to achieve their American dream. My parents, but my dad especially, has lived the American dream. One of nine kids, only one that got past the fifth grade, literally grew up in that house without electricity, without running water. Worked extremely hard, got his first job by calling companies out of the yellow pages until somebody would hire him here in Baton Rouge. As the son of, of immigrants, is this debate over immigration reform personal to you? This, to me, is such a simple issue where we are today. We don't need a thousand-page bill, a comprehensive bill out of the Senate. We need to secure the border. I think that it's pretty, it's pretty simple. You know, the president keeps talking about it. We need to just do it. And the reality is, if he was serious about it, he's been president now, he's in his second term. This could have been done by now. There's no excuse for this. Despite his southern drawl, Jindal is an extremely fast talker who rarely misses a chance to call out the president. I think the biggest frustration right now is the rest of the country versus D.C. He knows something about Washington having served two terms in Congress. Now, as a two-term governor, he's making education reform a priority. One of the things, the most important things we've done is to really give parents, to trust parents in terms of educating their kids. You have changed your mind on Common Core Standards for Louisiana. What, what changed for you? I think this was be originally presented as a bottom-up approach and instead has become a top-down approach. To me, this is the same fight you see when the left tells you we can't trust the American people to buy big gulps. We can't trust the American people to exercise their Second Amendment rights. We can't trust the American people to have religious liberty. We can't trust the American people to buy their own health insurance to decide what kind of health insurance they want. It's a calculated fight with Louisiana's Board of Education, and now some proponents of Common Core are suing him. Jindal and his wife, Supriya, have a girl and two boys of their own to think about educating. My kids were six, three, and one when we moved in the mansion. And the that was six years ago. Long After long labors with their first two children, Supriya knew their third child, Slade, wouldn't wait for the hospital, giving Jindal a chance to finally play the profession his dad dreamed for him, literally delivering his son at home. And she was in all this pain, and she was literally on the floor. I mean, there's no time to, to, to get prepared. When I saw her son covered in this purple goo, I was like, he doesn't look like he's done. I mean, maybe we should put him <laughs> back in for a little while. When I handed Supriya, when I handed her our child for the first time, all of that pain went away. She wasn't thinking about anything but her little baby boy, and I fell in love with her all over again. His wife of 17 years, she's the first girl he had a crush on and the first girl to break his heart. Many years later came their reunion at a Mardi Gras ball. In six short months, they were engaged. You know, God truly has a plan for us. Sometimes we don't understand it. If she had said yes in high school, I wasn't ready. I wasn't mature enough. I wasn't, I hadn't even accepted Christ yet in, in terms of who I was going to become as a person. You grew up in a Hindu home, right? How did you then make this transformation into what you call an evangelical Catholic? You know, I'd love to tell you I had a sudden epiphany. It wasn't that easy. You know, some people, it really is easy. You know, they get hit over the head and, and, they, and I think that's great. For me, it was a seven-year process. A journey of intense reading, study, and self-examination. It all clicked one day while attending a church production with a friend. In the middle of it, they showed a, a little film, nothing fancy, black and white film where there was an actor playing Jesus being crucified. Now, we've probably seen a thousand better movies. It was black and white, no famous actors. The camera was probably shaking. For some reason, when I saw the actor on the cross, God chose that moment to hit me harder than I've ever been hit before. All of a sudden, it just hit me. That's really the Son of God. If he's up there on that cross, not for a billion people, that's too easy. He's up there because of Bobby Jindal. If he's dying up there because of my sins, because of what I've done, what I've failed to do, how arrogant for me to do anything but to get on my knees and worship him. For now, he does what anyone with one eye on the White House typically does, raise money and campaign for candidates competing in the midterms. After the last presidential election, uh, you said the Republican Party was acting stupid. As we approach the midterms, as we approach 
2016, has the party grown any smarter? When I said we've got to stop being the stupid party, we've got to offer solutions. We cannot just be the anti-party. We've got to be four things. I think that this is still a center-right country. And I think if we will present specific solutions, if we go out there and fight for every vote and say, not only do we oppose what the other side is doing, we've got better ideas. Last fall, he launched America Next, a conservative policy group designed to develop some of those ideas. What is the greatest threat facing America right now? I don't think we can be beat by an external enemy. I think the greatest threat to America comes from within. We are blessed to be in the greatest country in the history of the world. But it's not inevitably so. We've got to renew that every generation. I think the biggest threat is that erosion of what it means to pursue the American dream. It's that assault on religious liberty. It's the undermining of what makes us an exceptional country. He's not expected to make a decision about running for president until after November. But he's not shy when it comes to talking about who he consults about the future. It's like Jesus, it's like God gives us the book of life. He doesn't let us look at every page, but he lets us look at the last page. And the last page, our God wins. He beats death, he beats Satan, he gets up off that cross. We should rejoice and we should live our lives with grace, glory, and humility animated by that sense that we, we worship an all-risen, uh, a risen, all-powerful God who's got plans that we won't necessarily understand. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Baton Rouge. Finally today, CBN's program Turning Point recently received recognition at the 34th Annual Telly Awards. Producer Erica Linney won a bronze Telly Award in the entertainment category for her feature story on the Gospel Quartet Sincere. The 34th Annual Telly Awards received over 12,000 entries from all 50 states and five continents. The awards honor the finest media productions across all platforms. Turning Point has broadcast for 17 years, reaching audiences throughout Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean. Congratulations to my friend Erica. Well, that's going to do it for now on CBN News Today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day and God bless.